to be here this afternoon to greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his great love and mercy to us. We're very his blessings be with every one of you. It's my sincere prayer. Now, I want to say that this has been one of the nicest little meetings I ever had in my life. Okay. And I am so thrilled to get to be here and trust that by God's grace and mercy, I get to be back again to be with you all sometime. And I have never in my life I have worked with any nicer group of people in serving our Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, bleeding for the things that he promised to give us. And it's been wonderful. Your faith should come abroad to all nations for such wonderful faith. And I am believing that you're just starting maybe here perhaps a great revival, great news. This should never die with me. And you're just, with all the, the unity among you people, you should never let this drop. You should just keep going. Just keep on moving on. Don't get tired. If you feel a little slack, just keep moving anyhow. Just go right on anyhow. Believe it. Just keep moving right along. Believe in God. And now, and I'm sure God will bless you. Now, I want to say to the to the ever who let us have the buildings here, the school, we certainly are very thankful that they, for the privilege that we have serving God here in this school. May it produce many, many students that will do great things for the education and the benefit of the nation and the kingdom of God. I trust that it will. And you young folks here, we're glad you won your ball game the other night. <laughs> So we're very happy for that, and so we are. I'm grateful for this bunch of custodians. My son was just telling me I don't get a chance to meet them. He says one of the nicest bunch of men, the custodians here in the in the building. And for these ushers, my boy said, "Daddy, that's one of the nicest bunch of brethren that you've ever met." Said you, and I'm so happy for that. And for all you people, every one of you, your faith, you've landed your faith in the time. Not one time have I had any interruption anywhere. Just a solid bank of faith everywhere. That very seldom happens like that. Usually you can feel maybe from here come a lot of criticism or here or something like that or somebody indifferent, but it hasn't been so here. It's just been one lovely unity of faith. And I'm, I just kind of hate to leave this afternoon. I really do. Right when we begin to see uh, uh, the night, everybody ready and the Spirit of God moving among them and have to leave. That's the trouble of having an itinerary. Uh, last but not least is for this wonderful bunch of ministers here. <laughs> I tell you, there really should be praise among you people to have good pastors like that. This little brother Brewer here, the chairman of this committee, he has labored faithfully and hard, and that little fellow has been on my coat for the last two or three years. <laughs> I just, there's no need of saying no, because if it said no one time, he was there the next time to see if I'd say yes. <laughs> I don't mean it quite this way, but... There was an unjust judge one time, you know. <laughs> he said, well, it, it wasn't that way just to get rid of him because he was such a fine little brother and always patient, no matter if he had to say no, that's, that's all right. Just a little bunch of nerves like, you know, he'd be right back the next meeting. Well, what about it now, Brother Brandon? He said, and he went on down to all around over the country, from down into Florida, following along to get his meeting. So, God bless Brother Brewer. And these ministers, I never got the opportunity to shake their hand until just now. I just walked down the line shaking hands with a bunch of men who stood behind me like that. I feel guilty. I really do. And I want to, while they're having their uh, big convention this summer, and if I can, to get at least one or two nights in with those brothers so we can sit across the table from one another and talk. 
I just love to do it. And coming from the, from the different places, I find letters coming in. And some of the nicest letters that I've ever gotten in my life. People just asking God's blessings on you and so forth. And then so nice from this uh, congregation. And ministers likewise. It's been very nice. And brother and sister, in I do not want to be just anything, be indifferent, but in this type of serving the Lord, and I'm sure my brothers will understand, it's a, it's a thing that I kind of have to keep away to myself, you see. If I don't, I come in at night and I'll say, I'll, I, well, I'm just so, I just don't know what to do, and I'll maybe speak a little while and have a congregational prayer and walk out, see. You've got to stay right under that anointing. I never could understand why our Lord, instead of the, as the day was over, go down and talk over with a group of people or in the cities, but he'd always go alone to himself out in the desert, way up away from the disciples and everything, to wonder why he did that. But I begin to understand now what he what he did. He must if certain parts of our life must be absolutely kept alone with God. And then I know that my brethren in the years to come, in the great eternity, that I want to make an appointment with every one of you this afternoon. <laughs> and let's go over to the new world at that day and go down to Jacob's well, you know, where he sat down a while. Don't have to worry about the little folks there. They ain't going to get hurt. Nothing there can bother them. Down by the, maybe the river of life, I know that's there, in the tree of life. And let's sit down there on a bank with each one of you just about a thousand years apiece, you see. It won't take me very long to do that. And we just get up and roam around. We have no less time to be there than when we first started. We just be there all the time. We just got just thousands of years will mean nothing there, you see. Just got forever. So want to be wonderful. I used to hear a little song amongst the the brethren and used to sing it in the churches, the full gospel churches out. There's going to be a meeting in the air and a sweet, sweet by and by. Oh, my. Could there be time for a little bit of testimony right here? I, when I first come amongst the Pentecostal people and see them dance on the floor, now that was just too much for my self-styled Baptist ways. You know, so I said, looky here. Now, dancing belongs out to other type of people. I said, not some religious people. I hear the music go to play and the people go to cry and they go to shout and that's why somebody starts dancing. I could say, I, I don't want to be critical, but I sure I'd be afraid to say something against God, it wouldn't be right. I never did criticize anything like that. And I said, Well, I'm, but you know, I can't get that. And I said, I wish I could see that in the Bible. And one night I was having a teaching on a, a chart of the second coming of Christ. And from Louisville, Kentucky, come a group of people over, and there's some young ladies. And they had, uh, uh, one of them was a piano player, and the other, and they had cymbals and a washboard. And my, they were making much music out of that. It was a brass band, almost. And they would, so I was teaching on the second coming, and so then, a few days before that, I'd been up to Salem, Indiana, where there's some Pentecostal people just getting acquainted with them. And um, they were dancing and going on, and I got to running a reference. I found out then that dancing, the first time I noticed it, Miriam began to dance. I thought, well, that must be from God, and the devil just patterned it off of it, you see. So then the next, I noticed that David danced when he saw the ark coming down the road, you see. And I thought, my, that's wonderful. And I noticed that King had made a... A rational vow one time, and he's about it. He sacrificed the first thing come from his house. And here come his daughter, and the, and the daughters uh, rejoice in dancing. And uh, I noticed how dancing was victory. And I thought, well, maybe I just haven't got victory now. <laughs> maybe just a little bit of self has to die out yet. Wasn't long after that, I was sitting there, and he just got through teaching. Well, a second coming of Christ and all the Spirit of God just taking her time moving in. It on a New Year's night. God's been teaching about two hours. So we they're all sitting around a great group of people in, a, in my tabernacle. So they sort of have a special. And so this, I said, I believe we got some folks from Louisville back there. There's 
some of them wrote a little note and put on there and had a one to play a special. Well, I said, come ahead. And so these uh, three or four little ladies got up and come up. One got on the piano. And she started playing. There's going to be a meeting in the air. And when she started, this lady got started these symbols on this washboard and hitting a tin can now and then like that. My, it got pretty good, you know. So I, I got, I noticed as, uh, then after a while, there's a little girl jumped out on the floor there and started dancing up and down, jumping around. I thought, oh, oh, right in my own church. Here it is. Now, now, I sure get, I'm rude for this. So I kept watching her, and you know, I kept hearing that this good reel, that lady playing on that piano. I believe she'd been three or four decks of keys. She could have played them. She's just playing the God's own son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. She no more get halfway out of that than she'd be started again. I thought, hmm. And she's got real white in the face, and she's her eyes closed and playing like that. I thought, say, I got to feel pretty good. Got patting my foot with that girl. Uh, well, you know, I thought, well. Maybe that's just my method is put anyhow, so I started patting her with you know, so you know it wasn't very long that I was out there with that girl down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I got the victory. <laughs> well, that's what it takes, isn't it? The victory. Just get away from self and just let the Holy Spirit have the right away. Say, well, it said decently in order. It'll be decently in order. Just let it go and see the Holy Spirit. Now, we're, I want to thank you all again for your kindness, and we're going to try for Lord willing. I sent Billy down a while ago, and, and I told him, I said, if there's people gathered in yet, well, you go down and give the folks some prayer cards. Maybe we can line up a little prayer line, pray for some of the sick this afternoon. Usually, on afternoon service to preach, but if I have. I thought maybe pray for some of the sick. We got to drive a long ways yet this afternoon and tonight, get in home about midnight, and then just lay down long enough to get a little rest and get up and Tuesday evening I've got to begin in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And then Wednesday in Shreveport, Louisiana. Sunday begin in Phoenix, Arizona. And the follow, through that week and through the following Sunday and then on Monday in the afternoon I begin at the Apache Reservation where one of the most mighty meetings I ever had in my early days was on the Apache Reservation. Thousands of Indians sitting there and talk about healing. Oh, I'll never forget one night. I hope I'm not taking too much of the time. But one night I got, to, I got there and I was speaking to them. Now, if there's anybody in the world that's got a raw deal out of this American term, it's the Indians. That's right. After all, we're the foreigners. He's the American God-given privilege. That's right. And we just beat him up and killed off his buffalo and run him back out there and put him on a place where thousands of them starve to death every year. If there ever was a stain on the American flag, it's the way we treat the Indians. Yes, it's not fair to send billions of dollars to Germany and to England and to Japan to build them up. So they can blow it back at us again. Charity begins at home. That's right, and our own people starving to death. And I said to God one night there at the Bird Auditorium in Phoenix that he had healed the first time I ever prayed for Indians, three Indian women, and God healed all of them, so I went back to the reservation. Remember that night? I couldn't, I spoke only one interpreter, and oh my, you talk about a language, you ought to hear that. There's no sentence, nothing else. They just start real low and start screaming and drop back. No, it's just it's terrible. So there's only one interpreter, and that was a, a woman. And she was about a half breed. So she could speak pretty fair English and could speak this passion. So I noticed the most beautiful sight. There's a little assembly of God church there. And I stood out on a platform, and the Indians just sat by the thousands out there. The most beautiful sight. Rolled their ponies in, you know, and had little fires burning. And I was speaking to them. And I said, now, I told them, I said, I think that you've got a raw deal. But I don't run the government. I'm just one of the government like you are. If I had my way, it would be different. Laying out there in a little tent, and half of them dead with TB and leukemia and everything. I said, it's, it's a disgrace, but I can't help that. But I said, what I'm trying to bring to you tonight is somebody who will give you a fair deal. 
That's Jesus Christ. That's right. I said, he'll never turn you down. He'll never make a difference. But your color, whatever it is, will be just the same to you as it is to all. I said, now, of course, I can only speak these things. And if God speaks it back and confirms what I'm talking about, then you believe the Lord. And so I said, anybody here wants to be prayed for now, I said, we have a line. I, as before, we had order enough to give out prayer cards, so we just just have to run them through the best we could. So I said, stand up. And usually, oh my, it'd be everywhere, but well, nobody stood up. And Indian's a very strange fellow. You have to watch him. Billy Paul was giving out prayer cards here some time ago down there to the Indians. I told him, I said, Billy, don't give those prayer cards to somebody with a headache. This, we got one more night. And I said, give it to people that's dying with cancer and something other. They can get them up there. Let them be prayed for. I said, they got to have a pickup and face right away. So they announced it at the platform. So they started down through the tent. And the Indians all sitting around the outside like this. So Billy starts down through the meeting, giving out prayer cards. And the fellow walked around to the Indian, take him on the back. And, hmm. and he said, Billy said, well, my daddy told me to give these out to people that's real sick. So what's the matter with you, Chief? He said, me sick. So well, what's you sick? What's your, where are you sick at, Chief? He said, me sick. That's all. So he said, go sit down, Chief. I'll give you a card in a few minutes if I can. So a little while, Chief kept watching them cards getting down lower and lower. So Chief walked over and patted him on the back end and said, hmm. He said, what's the matter with you, Chief? He said, me sick. He said, where are you sick at, Chief? He said, me sick. So he turned around and started off again. She fired him. <laughs> he played him on the back and he said, me sick. Billy handed him a prayer card and said, please write on there, me sick. <laughs> <laughs> me sick. <laughs> the strange. That night, when after a while, they brought some out of the inside of the little assembly of God church. So there's a lady there who was a pastor of that church. I forget what her name was. But anyhow, they, your evangelist packed the article of it. It's been about six years ago or seven. And when it comes, the first one come through was a lady. <clears throat> Great, big, strong-looking woman. I stood by her just a little while until I felt the anointing of the Spirit. I said, now, what your trouble is, is venereal disease. Not because she's immoral, but because she had to live so dirty. That's all. I said, a venereal disease, and she turned and looked at me when the interpreter said that. How did I know that? See? So that kind of got her. Well, good woman, just the way she had to live in uncleanness. And then, and a, after a bit, the next come out was a man with a, a leukemia of the eye. And so then, still the Indians kept looking at one another like that. And the next come out was a little boy, he wouldn't raise his head up like that. I said, turn and look up at me, I want to talk to you. And the mother, they're really rough. She just got the little fellow right to the top of the head like that and jerked his little head back and his poor little eyes just crossed as they could be. I thought, well, that's, that's all right. So I tucked the little fellow up in my arms like this. I prayed, oh, Heavenly Father, give grace now and power that I might find favor with these people. And while I was praying, I seen the little fellow standing before me. I just heard him leaning his little head over my shoulders and his eyes were straight. So I said, now, all of you raise up your heads, and they did around. I said, Ford, take him off my shoulders now. I won't turn around and let you all look at him like that. His little eyes straight, and he just rubbed his eyes and looking like that. Then I began to see him just smoking these big long pipes and things, begin spitting, you know, and talking to one another. Next come out was a, a little girl. And so she was deaf and dumb, a fever run her deaf and dumb. After having prayer for her, I got down and I went, like that, she turned around and looked at me. I said, can you hear me, honey? And she looked around like that. I said, do you hear me? I said, say mama, daddy. And she blabbered off something there. I said, well, she'll talk better. And the interpreter said, hmm, her talk he would right now. <laughs> I, just couldn't, I just couldn't understand it. Well, then that really started a row. It looked like a stampede. I tell you, the dust flying everywhere. Everybody's in the prayer line, man. And I'll never forget that night. Uh, there's so many, the, the, the white men couldn't keep the people off like that. They're just uh, warding on so greatly. And they showed a little line around, Brother Moore and a bunch of them there, holding a, their line like that. And then I said, let them come out of this building first. They started first. And the next come out was a poor old Indian mother with two broomsticks cut off with a board 
pole board up there for crutches, some rags wrapped around the top. And she was trying to get to me, and a little Indian boy was getting around her, so Brother Jack couldn't make him understand, so he just picked him up and set him back in the line. So his little fellow, about 17, 18 years old, Brother Moore's a little strong, stout, Irish type fellow, just set him back in the line. So the poor old thing, she's coming. I watched her. She had her hair braids hanging down, you know, and leather work in her hair. And she had set it out like his arthritis. And she move her foot. And... So she got right up close to me. And she just about had a high. And she all seats over. And she, her little back was bent down. And she stopped like this. And she raised her head and looked up. And that big old deep wrinkles, you know, and little tricks of tears running down through that old wrinkled face. And I thought, somebody's mother, sure. Somebody's mother. I thought, God only knows what the old things went through with. She looked up to me like that, just as pathetic. Her little black eyes rolled around, looked at me like that. She kind of smiled, put one crutch and put it with her hands to be straightened up and started walking off the platform like that. No prayer or nothing. Walked off through there and everybody began screaming long towards daylight that morning. Prayed all night. And about daylight the next morning, I was noticing, I was just passing, you didn't have to tell them nothing no more. Just, just put your hands on them. That's all they wanted you to do. So the next morning, when they is getting along towards daylight, Brother Brown come up and said, Brother Brown, you're about to faint now. I said, I got to take you out. I said, well, I'll try to get the most of them to. I said, what? I said, the interpreter, what's worrying me? What's them people so wet for? They're wet from up around the waist here. I said, well, at first they thought it was false. But said, now, I said, they, they're going out there into the deserts and bringing their loved ones in. And said, they're not going 20 miles down here to the ford. They're just wading right across the Gila Bend River, right there, coming across that way. Wading the water. And there was a, a next patient was an old man, and they had him on a board, not a stretcher like they bring patients here. It was a board, had two limbs across it, and they had an old man laying there, gray, his legs across one limb, his arms across the other, and like that, and he was shaking like that. And here stood a big fellow packing him like that. He was next in line. So he's standing packing him, he's shivering like that, his lips was real blue. And I said, you speak English? He said, Lito. And I said, uh, aren't you afraid you'll take pneumonia, wet like that? He said, Jesus Christ will take care of me. I brought my daddy. Very sweet. I said, that's your daddy? Yep. And I said, you believe if I ask Jesus healing? Yep. I said, well, come on by. The other fellow behind him passed by. No, I believe it was a woman packing him, maybe his sister by him, man and a woman. So when he got by, I said, you understand English, Chief? He said, didn't make a move. And I laid my hands on him and I said, dear God, you know what this poor old man's went through in life. And I ask now that you'll make him well. I said, may you get over this, recover, and be a normal well man to give you praise and he'll always remember that you did it. I said, now take him on. Have faith. And I called for the next one. Directly I heard a big noise down below me. Here the old man had the board on his own shoulder going out waving at everybody. <laughs> like that. Just simple faith. When they heard I was a hunter, they they, went, they got a reservation. Everyone wanted to saddle his pony and take me turkey hunting right there. <laughs> so uh, I'm going back now. I told him I'd be back and to keep my promise. I'd go back. That'll be a week from this coming Monday. Be praying for me. And uh, so uh, God will help up there. Win thousands to me. Now, it's just about time to start the prayer line. And I want to, maybe I could find five minutes of time. I was looking in the scripture here a few moments ago, and I found a scripture that I wanted to read to speak on just a moment before I read the other scripture. That's St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Just listen closely for a few moments. And it came to pass as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Jephthah and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen was gone out and were washing their nets. And he entered into one which was Simon, and he prayed him that he was thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down for the draw. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we toiled all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will lay down the net. Now, let's pray just a moment. Now, Father, anoint these words that have been read, and may they sink deep into the hearts of these sick people, and all that's in the building, we ask in Christ's name, amen. 
I'd like to take this just for uh, a moment or two here, just to, for the uh, a little time you're so good out here and respond so much to the ministry of preaching, so I just couldn't hardly leave without saying a word or two you like that. So now let's take it was the, just the beginning of his ministry. He just went out and performed a miracle and turned water into wine. And I would like to deal on that just for a minute to show what he'll do in the resurrection. How it eventually would have been wine. It would have been wine, all right. It went up through the vine, into the grape, out through the vat, soured, fermented, come on out with wine. But he just bypassed every bit of that and made it from water to wine. See? That's what he'll do in the resurrection. I ought to have to live to be up 22 or 23 years old at my best again. My me be an old man shaking and broke down like that. He'll just change it. Amen. And just bypass all that. Miss Branham and Mr. Branham will not have to be constituted or anything involved in my birth. He'll just call me from the dust, and I'll be just what I was at my best. So will you. Every person in here will turn back to a young person again. When you got to be your, you take dad and mother sitting out there, many of you. It hasn't been too long. I'm looking at an old couple sitting here now, many of you. Hair is turning gray. It wasn't long till you let her down to the altar. She's a beautiful young girl. He was a strapping young man. He holy wedlock. He was united together by God Almighty. And the first thing you know, they were all oh, have strong, how she admired him as a beautiful young man, and him, a, her, a pretty young girl. But first thing you know, he got up one morning, he said, Mama, you know, there's coming little wrinkles under your eyes. She said, Dad, I just happened to notice the gray hair coming. What's happened? Death set in. Right? It's going to get you. God's ordained it so. I asked the doctor the other day, I said, I want to ask you something, doctor. Every time I eat, I renew my life. Is that right? Yes, sir, he said. I said, when I was a young man, I kept eating, eating, and every time I'd get stronger and stronger, and all at once I eat the same food, and I'm getting older all the time. Why is that? <laughs> I said, figure that one out. I'm eating the same kind of food, putting the same new life in, but I'm withering away all the time. That's one of them. See? <laughs> I said, why? God said so. No matter what it is. See, scientifically, that could not be proved. See, scientifically, that's all against science altogether. See, because if I knew, renew my life, I'm getting new all the time. But I'm renewing my life, and I got new to a certain age, and I start getting old and taking the same new life in all the time. See? So then, what is it? God ordained it. First thing you know, we'll come down to the end of the river someday, old and gray. Perhaps mine will come too, I like think. But all that Death done for you here, when it, you die, that settles it. And then in the resurrection, you'll be the pattern that God made you, that young man and young woman, and you and mother will be in eternity or in the great millennium, young men and young women again forever. I can prove that by God's word. Next time, I'll do that in a camp meeting, you Lord willing. <laughs> That's right. Show it to Sarah and Abraham and all the promises and everything will lead right straight to that. We haven't got a thing to worry about. Not a thing. That meant for the healing service, I was getting in on that this week, see, to, to get that. We'll try it and see if you don't holler for a healing service. So, um, to get in on that where you see, it takes all the fear away. My, you just, there's nothing in the world can harm you. No, we're bound to the promised land. That's all there is to it. God can't take his word back. It couldn't be God. <laughs> I might take mine back because it ain't true, but his, his is true, and he can't take his back. And how beautiful. Now to think of Jesus right in the beginning of his ministry there, and how wonderful it was to see him, and his, how in his power he went forth and done signs and wonders, and here he is down to the uh, guessing at the lake there. And uh, I can imagine the stir around the people that had a meeting that evening or the evening before, and so Great signs have taken place, so they say, say, you know that young evangelist that's the preaching here, that uh, healer? Well, he's having a service down there at the bank this morning. I noticed all the women coming down off the hill, going down, the man left their plows in the field to go down here and talk. A little something about him that seems different. I just imagine there is. Don't you, brother? Yeah, yes, sir. And he was standing there, and the first thing you know, the press got so hard, the people pressed up on him to hear the word of God. Oh, I love to hear good preachers. Amen. I just love to hear 
But oh, I would sacrifice every bit of it if I could hear him just in one sermon, wouldn't you? I'd like to hear him when he stood there and said, Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'd love to hear that. We'll never hear that, I guess. But we will hear this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the man. All over them. And how he stood there and he would speak to the people. Now, I can imagine seeing about three tired fishermen or four sitting out there on a stump or a chunk. He got up there and said, let's hear what this fellow's got to say. We heard Dr. Jones and all of them. Let's hear what he's got to say. I can imagine Simon scratching his head and saying, say, you know what? Just like any other sinner when he comes in the church, he gets the very last seat he can. He sat way back. You know that better in the church. So he's going to scratch his head, you know, and he said, you know, there's something different about that fellow. So he just picked up his chunk and moved it up a little closer. And as Jesus began to speak about the kingdom and the coming of the end of the world and the powers of God and the lovely things that he talked about, he said, you know, that guy talks a little different from others. Let's move up a little closer, James, you and John. So just kept moving up, and after a while, we're standing right by him. And the press got so hard that Jesus said to, to Simon, he said, uh, got in Simon's boat, Borrowed it from him a few minutes, and after he got through speaking to the crowd, he said, Simon, launch out now into the deep and let down for the draw. Why? He said, Lord, you know, we're, we're fishermen here. We, we know all the calendar. We know when the waters are coming right, and we're fishermen. We're born here on this way, and we've seen through this thing all night long, and we haven't even taken a, a fish. While the waters are just not right, the fish is some other part of the lake. There's just none out there. Now, he knew that in his heart, see. Now, they were fishermen. They know all the signs that made their living by fishing. They were commercial fishermen. Their occupation was that. So they know all about the lake and when the waters was right, and they've sang all night long and hadn't even taken a fish, so he's taken nothing. And they were washed out their nets, and you all know what a discouragement that is. You live this close to the river and fish all night and catch nothing. But Jesus said, Now go out into the lake again, right where you was at, and let down for the draw. Let down and take up a whole net full of them. Now, Peter knew there was no fish out there, because he's staying right to them same waters all night. Out deep, so many fathoms, up and against the wind, to the wind, from the wind, and everything, and no fish at all. They showed out their nets all night long, staying right back. He said, Now, you go out and let down the net for the whole take up, the big draw. Look, Peter said, Lord, we've stained all night and taken nothing. But nevertheless, at your word, I'll lay down the net. There it is. If God said so, faith will put some fish there if there is any in there. That's right. At thy word, Lord, we're going to lay down the net. That's right. Wish I could stay on that a little bit, but I can't. Now look, you may have seen through every doctor's office there is in the country. You may have been in every hospital and every clinic there is around here. You may have went through prayer line after prayer line for people praying for the sick. But let's take this this afternoon. At thy word, Lord, I'm going to let down the net right now. I'm going to believe it. Right I'm going to settle it. I'm going to settle it once forever. I, he, I know, Jesus, that you're sitting at the right hand of the Father as a high priest. A high priest is to make intercessions upon confession. And that's what Hebrews 3 says. He is the high priest of our profession and confessions of St. Translation. And there he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions upon our confession. Now, he cannot heal you or cannot save you or do one thing for you until first you accept it and believe it and confess it. That's right. You've got to confess it. Not you've got to feel it. You've got to confess it. He's not the high priest of your feelings. He's the high priest of your confession. That's right. What you confess. Now, if you get prayed for, sit in this building this afternoon, the Holy Spirit will move in here and you feel his blessed presence and hear the word going forth, saying he be healed all and so forth like that, and seeing the power of God, hear it go forth and tell him it's for everyone. And you walk out and say, well, I feel just as bad as it did when I went. He couldn't do a thing for you. And you say, well, I'm, I, I accept it now. And then in the morning you get up and say, well, I still got that headache. I still feel as bad as it did. Then you drop right down. You'll never live above your confession. Let the saintless person in this building right now just make up in your mind that you're not a Christian anymore. That's when you become not a Christian. See? When you go out and say, are you a Christian? No, I used to be, but I'm not no more. You're falling from grace right now. See? It's faith. See? 
It's either faith or unbelief. You're possessed with those two powers, either faith or unbelief. If you've got faith, you're saved because you are a believer. If you haven't got faith, is you're a sinner. I said here some time ago, preaching a Methodist church. I said, drinking whiskey is not a sin. Smoking cigarettes, committing adultery is not a sin. A little old sanctified Methodist mother sitting there, she said, then preacher, what is sin? <laughs> I said, unbelief. That's sin. Smoking, drinking, gambling, and committing adultery, and stealing, lying, and so forth is not sin. It's the attributes of sin. You do that because you're an unbeliever. And you don't, you say, well, I'm a Christian, I don't smoke, I don't drink, you might not commit adultery, steal, tell a lie, keep all the commands and still be a sinner. See? That's just attributes. It's to change your heart, what the Holy Spirit does in you. Makes the tree bear fruit. Is that right? By the fruit you shall know them. You're a sinner because you are an unbeliever. You're a Christian because you're a believer. Jesus Christ said this in St. John 5, 24. Think of that handful and two dozen of ages if you want to read it when you go home. Read 5, 24. He, not Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, he, personal pronoun, that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, present to him, and shall not come into condemnation, but hath passed his Pass from death unto life. That's what he said. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. You believe that? That's what Christ said. So it's his faith. Your faith, what do you say? Well, glory to God, preacher. I don't believe in all this stuff. And I still, no. If you got real faith, it'll declare your work. You see, your, your work will declare what your faith is. A boy told me here not long ago, said, if God judges me according to my to my faith, I'm saved. He said, he judged me according to my morals, I'm lost. I said, your morals testify of your faith. You can't never make nothing out of a grain of wheat but wheat. You'll never make it a cup of earth. It'll always be wheat. Because it was sold wheat, it'll raise up wheat, it'll remain wheat. It may be disfigured to anything else, but it'll still be wheat. And if it's a cup of earth, it'll actually be a cup of earth. You'll never make wheat out of it. Is that right? Well, the Christian, the believer, is sold with the incorruptible Word of God. How can it produce anything else? See? That's it. When it gets in there, it, the Holy Spirit comes in on the Word of God that's sunk deep in your heart. It'll water it, and it'll grow out, and you'll just automatically, you won't, as like I said last night, you won't have to take the leaves off the tree. The new life pushes out and takes the old leaf off. It makes you live a different person. Now, at thy word, Lord... I will let down the net. And when he enclosed this drop of species, he was astonished. And Jesus said to him, so don't fear, from henceforth you'll catch man. Oh, at thy word, Lord. I think of Peter when the Lord told him, said, come, walking on the water. Why, Peter never walked on water, never heard of anybody else ever walking on water. I don't know how to walk on water, Lord, but at thy word, here I come. <laughs> and he did. That's right. The woman... Uh, oh, many times we just call up different things in the scriptures if we had time of the people who uh, things Mary had never known about how a baby could be born to virgin birth but she took God at his word that's our word Lord she went testifying before anything happened she testified it was going to happen because she took God at his word and left us this afternoon take God at his word now and here's what he said in his word whatsoever things Mark eleven twenty four. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive it, Amen. and it shall be given unto you. You'll have it. Now, isn't that simple? Now, I love you, and I don't want there to be one single person in this building this afternoon that won't be healed. See? And I believe with all my heart and holding my faith as I spring in the room a while ago before leaving, God, please heal every person or shake them so hard that they'll know it's a judgment that I've told the truth about this, see, that there won't be one feeble person left in the midst of the people. Lord, Lord. I see vision over the people, but I can't say that they're healed until he tells me they're healed. And he can't tell you your faith actually acts. And your faith acting will bring God's word to pass. You've got to believe it, accept it, testify it, say, I receive it now, Lord, and that settles it forever. 
No matter what I feel like, nothing about it, I'm going to believe it anyhow. Remember, I had that stomach trouble, regurgitation. A male brother told me I had not even one earthly chance, not one chance in ten million to live. And my stomach was stemmed to just one raw, bloody ulcer. And I went to the table and sat down. I asked the blessing they didn't give me any barley water and prune juice and a cracker, a graham cracker. About two of them at supper, two at breakfast, and let me have it twice a day. I just read in there what God said. So I asked the blessing. My poor father, I remember how he looked when I asked the blessing. I guess the first time the blessing was ever returned at our table. I said, just a minute, Papa, I want to pray. And Mom started crying. And we had some beans and cornbread and onions for dinner. You know what it is. It's a good rib builder. So I, I said, after she said, Mother said, I will pour you your barley juice. I said, give me some beans. And she said, oh, honey, the doctor says no. I said, but God said yes. And I, he said, now, uh, honey, now, it's all right. I don't mind you being religious, but said, you can't do that. said, because now, look, there's, there's reasons to think. I said, there's no reason that God's word just says this way he said it. And if I die, I'm coming to him believing his word. That's right. I said, I'm sick and tired of this. That's right. Been suffering for two years or more like that and couldn't hardly stand up, weighed 80 pounds. I said, I'm tired of it. I'm going to take God in his word. And she said, well, honey, I ain't going to pass it to you. I said, I'll reach over and get it then. So I went to dealing out the beans in there, got me a big plate full. First time I'd had any solid food, a big piece of cornbread baked in a pone. Y'all yeah, know where you ever done that? Break out the corner of it like that. Went to eating. Mmm, nah, I was raised on that. So uh, somebody else has had it too. <laughs> So then I, I got to eat this, sir. I got a big mouthful of it, went to chewing it, you know, tasted good. And when I swallowed it, as soon as I swallowed it, it just like a lump of fire hit my stomach and here it come back up. I held my hand over my mouth. I said, oh, no. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You're going to stay right there. Mm-hmm. I swallowed it back. You come up again. I swallowed it back. You come up again. I swallowed it back. I said, now you stay there. Because here's another one coming. I got another one like that, got me another mouthful. I kept on just like acid, oh my, my, never, my stomach like a coal fire. I was chewing on my eyes, brightened, I guess, and popped it. How you feeling? I said, wonderful. <laughs> kept on chewing, swallowed it again, here it comes, I hold my head away, I said, Phew. excuse me, I was belching. <clears throat> it was other than the beans coming up, so I just kept on eating like that. And when I left the table, Mom went and called the doctor, and she said, Well, he eats beans and cornbread. Said he's been reading the Bible. Said he says that God healed him. Why, he said, That'll kill that boy. Said he'll have chewed indigestion and die. Said we'll have to pump that out of him in the next hour. I thought, Oh, that's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in the house, and I started through the house, holding my stomach like this. You know, Mama said, You're as sick as you can be. I said, Mother, I feel fine. I said, yes, this is wonderful. Now, when he went got in the room, I said, I can, I will, I do believe. I can, I will, I do believe. Can, I will, I do believe that Jesus heals me now. I'll take him at his word. That's right. That's our word, Lord. I'm believing it. I went in. I got to weak, and everything began to swim around for me. I just kept walking through the Lord and saying, I can, I will. Mother said, Billy, you're sick. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm so happy. I can't hardly sit still. I said, oh, I can, I will, I do, Billy. I went into my room. I said, I'm going to read my Bible a while. And I went in there and laid down across the bed, and all my hearing was starting. I went, no, no. I got up, went out on the railroad track, kept walking. Day at, and when supper time come, well, we were poor. Had to have beans and cornbread again for supper. But when I sat at the table, asked the blessing again, Pass more beans and cornbread. I give that stomach a good going over. And I all that night I didn't sleep ten minutes. Oh my I lay down, my heart was fluttering and jumped like that. I raised up and I can, I will, I do believe. Yeah. It started again. Next morning he was laying right there, and so I, I give him something else. And I kept on, kept on, kept on, walked down the street and I went back to work and I stand in the ditch with my old camp like that, camp in the ditch like this, and oh it was so sick. Somebody come in and said, Hello, Billy, how you doing? I said, Just fine, praise the Lord. Just feeling good. 
shovel in some more dirt and camp like that. Yes, sir, go down the street and someone say, How you feeling, Mr. Brandy? I said, Just wonderful. The Lord healed me just as sick as I could be. Somebody said, Well, you lie. I said, Oh, no. I was making confession of what he did by his stripes. I was healed. Oh, Hallelujah. Don't invite me for a team on stage, so I'll take you up. <laughs> All right. And I never weighed in my life over 118 or 20 pounds, and I weighed 160 this afternoon. Praise God, amazing great, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I will go to the corners of the world, from the tropical jungles of the south, to the four rows and regions of the Iceland, telling the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'll challenge any person under any condition to take God at his word and see if it's right or not. I'm obligated to his word. Just say it's mine right now. That's it. No matter what the doctor says. The doctors are good now. I have nothing against doctors. No, sir. Of course, now, we got a lot of doctors. The strange thing, I'll tell you something true. In my travel, I found more believing doctors than I have preachers. That's right. More believing doctors than I have preachers. And I, I found preachers, they don't believe in divine healing. Oh, no. But a doctor, he'll tell you, yes, yes, sir. I've seen patients I've laid out and they come back to life again and other things. I've met many, many believing doctors, fine fellows. They're God's gift to the world. They give it to us. What will we do without health today and then without the sanitations and so forth? It's all right. It's God's provided way. Oh, I know you say, I don't believe in that. Well, that's all right. That's all right. You, your grandfather went to see your grandmother in an ox cart, but your son goes in a, <laughs> almost a jet plane, doesn't he? See, science has come up. That's all right. We accept every bit of it. That's all true enough, and I like that. But after all, it's God in all, through all, over all, exactly. God's the healer. There never was one drop of medicine ever healed a person, and never will be. Psalms 103, 3 said, I'm the Lord, and he was all right as easy. Look here. If I cut my hand, I've used this illustration. Cut my hand with a knife. We got the best doctors we ever had in all the ages. We got the best hospitals, the best medicine we ever had, and got more sin and unbelief than we ever had. Right? Notice, if I cut my hand, we haven't got one medicine that can heal that hand. You haven't got any decent, logical, right, sensible doctor that would tell you. Males is the best clinic we got in the world, as far as I know. And in order to interview that, he said, we don't claim to be healers, Brother Branham. We only claim to assist nature. There's one healer that's God. Right? Now, if I cut my hand here with that knife, now, there isn't enough medicine in the world to heal that hand. There isn't one thing that they got that will heal a knife cut. No, sir. Well, if they got anything that will heal a knife cut, it would heal the knife cut in this desk. It would heal the knife cut that was in my coat. Well, if it would heal a knife cut, it would heal it on anything. Is that right? Water that's wet in this building would be wet outside. <laughs> See? If it heal a knife cut, oh, he said, Brother Branham, medicine is made for the human body, not for your coat and that desk. All right. For instance, then, I uh, cut my hand and I fall dead. And they take me down to the undertaker's establishment and bomb my body with a, a fluid that will make me look natural for 50 years. We'll send get Mayo's Clinic, the best doctors. We'll send to John Hopkins. They'll come down and look at that hand. They'll sew that hand up, give me a shot of penicillin every day, and put sulfur drug in it, and all the salves and everything that can be got in 50 years in a day that cuts just exactly like it was. Well, now, if medicine heals the human body, why don't it heal it? Oh, you said, Brother Branham, the life's going out. Now, that's right. That's right. Which is the healer, then? The medicine or the life? Life is the healer. If you tell me what life is, I'll tell you who God is. That's right. God. Life does. Medicine don't build tissue. God builds tissue. Medicine can't build tissue. If they could do that, they could reproduce a man. That's right, but they can't do it. So God said, I'm the Lord, and he of all of thy diseases. That don't condemn the medicine. They just keep it clean while God's a healing it. A doctor can set your arm. It's been broke. But if God don't heal that arm, it'll, it'll be broke the rest of your life. He can set the bones in place, but God has to produce the calcium and life in there to knit them bones together. Is that right? So the doctor didn't heal your arm. The doctor set your arm. God healed your arm. But then the fight pull a tooth out. Well, what about that socket that come out of? Let me see him heal him up. Can't do it. 
nothing to heal it with. He has to let God do it. Is that right? So God's the healer. Amen. God bless you. I stand here. I talk to you all afternoon. And God be with you. I love you with undying Christian love. The warmest of Christian love I send to each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. I started to say, maybe I better not. Or I will. Look, many times you hear on these radio programs, write us a card, give us a card. That's merely to get your address for soliciting. But dear Christian friends, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it because I love you. If you need a prayer call for anything, send to me for it. It's absolutely free. You see, or anytime I can do anything for you in that way, and it's not for your mailing address. I don't have any radio programs. I don't have anything to sell, any papers or anything else. I just preach the gospel to you. And it isn't my brothers here and things like that. They have their programs and things like that to support them and that. But for me, if I can see a favor to you, well, you know where I live, it's Jefferson Village, Indiana. I used to tell the people the rain never falls too hard or the night never gets too dark while I come to you. But I, so many, I can't say that now, I see, because perhaps there's a half a dozen airplane tickets laying there now when I get in tonight to fly somewhere to pray for sick people besides an average call to run 60 or 70 a day and maybe more than that, just emergency calls to come so you couldn't start to make it, you see, there's no way. But I do take every one of them sincerely before God in praise. Okay. The Lord bless you while we bow our heads. Kind Heavenly Father, may thy grace and mercy ever rest upon this people. Bless these people, Lord, who have give a portion of their living this week and this afternoon, Father, for a love offering for thy unprofitable servants, dividing their living with me. God, I'm not worthy to receive it. I, I, I asked God if it wasn't that I just had to have it, I would refuse it. Thou knowest all things. And I pray that you'll bless every one of them a hundred fold for in the scripture. Insomuch as you have done unto the least, that would be me. Of the little ones, you have did it unto me. And may they receive that type of reward, or a double potion of blessing. Bless these dear brothers, your servants, these ministers, loyal and faith. God, may that each one of their churches just grow until they'll have to build new churches. Send thousands of blessed converts to them, Father. Sinners coming their way and be saved. Bless their ministry and may their prayers for the sick when they pray for sick people. May every one of them get healed, Lord. May everyone give my brothers this afternoon power to pray for the sick. Grant it, Lord. And for these handkerchiefs, I ask, dear kind Father, as there's many here represented sickness, I pray that you'll heal every one that these handkerchiefs represent. And when they're laid upon the sick and afflicted, may the power of God come upon them and they go free. Have mercy, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Thank you for the great meeting that we just had. And I pray, kind Heavenly Father, that you'll give us the exceedingly abundantly this afternoon. And may thy Holy Spirit come present now and heal the sick and save the sinners, and we'll give thee the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I never thought of it getting so late. All right, we're going to call a prayer line. Oh. Hard boy to keep up with. <laughs> what the? I never did ask you what card. Oh, what we had at Jay's up Let's begin with the J's today, then. All right. Let's start and finish up on the that we started on last night. Maybe if we get a chance, we can run through some more of them. But now, the prayer card just merely gets somebody up here. That don't have one thing to do with healing. There's more people healed sitting out there without prayer cards than there is here with prayer cards. Who's got J number one? We started from 51 out last night. Who's got J number one? You ladies? All right. Come right here. J2, who's got that? J2. Maybe we'll get a few of one, then get to another letter. Two, all right. On up. Racial uh, affair. Yes, ma'am. 
stuff was a nervous condition, aren't you? That's right. You're very upset about something. Turning dark in between you. You are you got a spiritual trouble too. That is true, isn't it? Some difficulty you're having. It'll be all right. Just trust the thing in. And here's another thing that might help you. You're healed now. But here's another thing that might help you. You've got a, a sick loved one, and that's a father. Is that true? And his father was a mental condition, is that right? You're going to find him different when you go home because of your attitude. <laughs> Every person in here should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, even now. Is that right? Every person should have faith and believe our dear, loving Savior. Believe that he is here. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe the man here is a stranger to me, too. Is that right, sir? I do not know. You have never seen him. But our loving, kind, heavenly Father knows both of us. That is true. You're in desperate need, my friend. What's your trouble is nervousness. You've uh, got a whole lot of trouble. Part of this, you're a married man. You've lost your job. And you're having mental troubles over that. You have two children, too, don't you? Don't fear. It's going to be all right. Come here. I am Heavenly Father, in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, bless this brother and restore him. In Jesus' name, he has a need, Father, and thou wilt supply it. We ask in Christ's name. Look, my brother, don't worry about that no more. Get off your mind. Go happy, rejoicing. God will give you another job. <laughs> Just have faith. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, Gil, that's real trouble sitting over there, sir. Yeah, you see, you're just saying, stand up. I see it move over you. God bless you. And go home. Mm -hmm. Just have faith in God. Lady, you want to get over that rupture sitting up there? Yes, yeah, sitting there. If you accept it right now, you can be healed where you're sitting there. The big lady there, God bless you. You can go be made go. Have faith in God, my. You just only believe. You want to get over the sinus? If you believe it with all your heart, sitting up there, you can get over the sinus and be made well. You accept it. Believe in Jesus Christ makes you whole. God bless you. How wonderful. I just praise God for His presence. You're the patient, are you, lady? I don't know you. God knows you. Do you believe me to be His prophet? Now, that's just His preacher. Do you believe that to be true? Your operation didn't do you any good, did it? You just come to the hospital. You had a, something wrong in here. They operated in. It's a gallbladder operation they had. Gall stones. What to remove the stone from the bladder. You can't keep nothing on your stomach. You're real weak. Is that right? Jesus Christ will make you well. You believe that? Come here. Kind Heavenly Father to this poor little dying woman standing here frail and, and the doctors have done all they can do for her. And we thank you for what they've done, but Father, they haven't they haven't hit it yet. Satan, you've hid from the doctor in front of his knife, but you can't hide from God. Come out of her. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, leave the woman if she can make it. I wasn't yelling at you, lady. It was him. He's trying to hold you. Go get all right now. You go on just rejoice and be happy. Thank God. Excuse me, friends, if I yelled out loud. It wasn't like yelling at you. Demons sometimes have to be forced. See? They don't want to move. That was woman was he is determined to take her life. There's something wrong with her, I forget what it was, but anyhow, the doctor had operated or something like that. I've seen it with all good faith, but he hadn't hit the spot. But you watch her now. See what happens. You get well. <laughs> Somebody just healed, had a connection with you. Isn't that right? Some young man a while ago or something. Oh, is that what it was? See it move in there some way. Y'all from a city called Lincoln, isn't it? Lincoln, Illinois. <laughs> How'd he do, lady? You believe me to be God's servant with all your heart? If Jesus Christ is standing here with this suit on, as far as healing, he'd tell you he'd already did it. But for your healing, he has already done it. But he'd tell you what, what your trouble was. And but that might make you have faith. Well, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he sent me to do that. Do you believe that? Then I can, by doing so. You're... You're suffering with some kind of a like a headache, this migraine headache. Isn't that right? You're extremely nervous. You have some kind of a trouble in your bowels, colon trouble. Isn't that right? You've just had something that's happened in your home. No, it's a you've had a cross eyed child who Is that right? That was in this meeting. I thought I see it's on this same platform. Isn't that right? You have a wonderful face, lady. Just a minute. Here it comes again. You're not from the city, old. You're from a you're from a, a country where there's lots of hills. It, it's a it's a mountain, Colorado. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. Wrigley or something like that. I see the name as you come into the city. You're on the side. Of, is that right? And you're. And it, I hear somebody calling you Kathleen. Is that right? White. Is that right? Go home. Amen. I see where it's at now. There was something wrong with that lady about intestines or something there. That man sitting right there with a blue looking suit on looking at me. You don't have a prayer card, do you, sir? The blue tie sitting there? You got bowel trouble, haven't you? You're going to get well now. God bless you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't doubt. Just have faith. Only believe, for all things are possible to them that believe. You believe that is right? Everyone with one accord. How did you? Are you the patient lady? Excuse me. All right. We're strangers to one another, lady. As far as I know, I never seen you in my life. I know nothing about you. God knows that. You're a mighty young lady to be standing there sick. I want to ask you something. Do you believe me to be God's prophet? With all your heart? Then I can help you. If you, he told me if I get the people to believe that, and they, and that, I said they won't believe it. He said you'll tell them the secrets of their hearts. Then they'll believe them. 
Now, Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Yes. Nothing wrong with you.